Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again. In today's video, my crazily entitled mother demands I give the business I inherited from my father to my useless lazy sister just because she is pregnant and according to my mom deserves to have it more than me. Here is what happened, let's dive right into the story. And the first one starts like this. My father died recently, it really was a tragedy, even if it was a chronic health condition that led to it, he was only 64. We both knew it was a possibility and he prepared for everything. The last thing he should have had to prepare for was his own ex-wife and daughter, my mother and sister, to come in and try to take advantage of his death. I bet they celebrated when they heard the news, these harpies. Anyway, I guess it would help for me to explain some of the groundwork first. My parents were never great together, my father told me what it was like when they were dating and first committing to a life with each other and it must have seemed great back then. For as long as I can remember, they were like oil and water. It was not even all the aggressive fighting or screaming that you sometimes get from domestic disputes, my father was just level headed and would leave when he knew it was either that or was screaming. Maybe that steadiness kept them together for two kids but it couldn't do it forever. Especially when my mom started drinking, my dad's disgust and disappointment led her to drink even more and eventually got her addicted to some other unsavory things. Neither was faultless in the relationship and my mom did not like seeing my dad walk away from her when she felt like she was finally getting through his emotional shell but my mom turned this dissatisfaction to drinking and drugs while my dad stayed industrious. Ultimately, that was their biggest difference. My mom cared about the moment and was never good at hard work, while my father was the most industrious and hardworking person I know. Well, knew, I guess. Anyway, I do have a younger sister, my parents split when I was about 12 and my mom dropped any word of a custody battle when my dad let her have my sister. I had always admired and tried to emulate my dad, so I don't think my mom could stand me and my sister was always her spitting image. Looking back now that I'm older, I do think it was irresponsible of my dad to leave my sister to that fate when he almost surely would have gotten custody what with the drugs and alcohol involved. I think he did it because of what his work entailed. My father was very successful in his career but he stepped away to start his own business. This meant that for a few years right before the divorce I was not seeing much of him as he built this thing from the ground up. This is part of the reason my sister never really got to know dad. When the split happened, rather than send me home to be alone in the evenings, I got to come along and become a fixture in his workplace when I was not in school. As soon as I showed interest, he was taking every opportunity to teach me. I finished high school, but I did not care much for my grades and never even thought of college. Really, my true education came from my father. So I was 27 when my father died and while I did inherit his business, I'm hardly one of those that is just handed a great fortune. The company's biggest growth was from the period of time when I was 16 to now. I was there for every big decision for the company, since my parents divorced and for almost all of the last decade I at least had some sort of say in the company. This company was passed to me because it had become as much mine as my father's and this is my best way to honor his life and the time we spent together. So I'm working one day at the office and I get a notification from my secretary. My mother and sister are visiting? If I remember correctly, they did not even show up to my dad's funeral, which means it has officially been 5 years since I've seen my mother and nearly the same for my sister. Me and my sister do keep up with each other on social media, but don't communicate at all besides that and I do my best to not keep up with my mom at all. It seems to be much better for my mental health and my mom is not likely to be turned away quietly by a secretary, so I tell her to send them in. If whatever they want is reasonable, then I will just give it to them and just send them on their way. I expected my mom to put up some sort of resistance when she was notified that she would receive nothing from my dad's assets, he even sent my sister something for a rainy day fund. Not that it would make it to the rainy day though. I had some set aside just to get my mom out of my life if she came knocking. My plan is to wait until she brings up money and then give some resistance only to grudgingly give it to her. Cannot make it seem too easy or she will want more and if I make it too difficult she will just make a scene. My mother sits down in my office and my sister keeps wandering around looking through the glass and mumbling exclamations under her breath about how fascinating it all was. Being around my mother always did regress my sister to a childish state and she looked like a kid at an aquarium right now. 
My mother gives me her regrets that she missed the funeral and I'm already searching for how to speed up this conversation. I brush over her gratefulness for their gifts in the will and assume that mom probably spent her own daughter's inheritance. I brush over all her awe and admiration for the company that she never had while my dad was alive. I'm dragged to a screeching halt when she mentions how grateful she is that dad gave her the company. I think my ears start working again right around when she says, of course, I can still let you run the company if I can trust you not to bring it to the ground because I'm the one who owns it. And well, I hardly want to do the grunt work of day-to-day -day decision making, but I have candidates if you think we cannot work together. I reply, I don't know what you're talking about. Dad left the company to me. I was there when they opened the will and I saw how he distributed his estate. Mom tossed an envelope onto the desk. That will was outdated. Then she had the audacity to turn her back to me like I was an afterthought. She turned to my sister and said, Are you excited? Yes, mummy. Yes, my sister still calls her mummy. Mom turned back to me and said, Dad would like it better this way, OP. He trained with you all the skills you need to start another business. And now this business can help fund your sister's child so we can provide the best education for your sweet little niece. Or nephew, if it comes to that. To think that I congratulated my sister on her pregnancy on social media just a week or two before. Even amidst working out my father's estate as the chief executor and noting the fact that she couldn't show up to the funeral of the man who helped bring her into this world. I grabbed the will and tore the envelope open. I hardly had to skim the thing before it becomes obvious that this is not even a good forgery by my mom. Do you think I'm an idiot, mom? This is a joke, right? What do you want? Money? I can give you some money. It seems dramatic now, but I did pull out my wallet and toss a few bills at mom across the desk. Then she told my sister to start closing the blinds and leaned forward into her lecturing pose. I was thankful that my phone ringing gave me the chance to reach out and type a few numbers before she could get started. Well, I think that's disappointing that I somehow brought such a disrespectful, ungrateful creature into the world. She got her pointing finger out and was jabbing at me, herself and the desk alternatingly. I think that my word is law to you since you sprung out of my womb and I'm tired of you acting high and mighty flaunting your wealth over your own mother. I let your father keep you and I let him teach his business to you so that your sister could inherit it and you would have the skills needed to go off on your own. You should thank me for what you have and get the F out of your sister's company if you're not gonna respect us. And well, I followed my dad's example. I may have gotten a bit overdramatic by throwing money at her, but now I was level. Mom, that forgery will never make it past the simplest glance before anyone in the court system sees it for what it is. I will give you this one chance to back down here. Now, with the blinds closed, all of her care for her public image went out the window. She stood up and screeched at me. I won't be lauded over by this same stoic act like your father used to do. Both of you treat me like crap. I demand that you sign the business over to your sister so that my grandchild can have what they need. What they need? An education? Or are you thinking you would prefer to just get some blow and use one of your voided credit cards to cut a line or something? My mother's roar of rage was pitiful. She went swiping at the things on my desk and she threw down picture frames, my computer monitor, a lamp and she did not mess with my phone though. I stood and watched her throw her tantrum and I recognized the look on my sister's face as the exact same look she wore back when we were kids dealing with my mom's drunken rants. Fear, confusion, a hope for it to be over soon, I was fine letting it go on. She took out a shelf and broke plenty of glass. She walked up to my face and brought her pointer finger out again right in front of my nose. I stared past it. Now you step out of your sister's office and I will forgive you. No, she slapped me. I said, so now you will turn to assault? Assault? You're the one who assaulted me and then tried to do worse to your own pregnant sister, you pig. Or at least that's what I will tell the cops that you dialed yourself earlier. As if I wouldn't notice that. She was so smug at that moment. It was not the cops, I said. I allowed some confusion to cross her face before I finished. It was the intercom. Your rant has been going on for the entertainment of the whole company you hope to inherit off of forged legal documents and signatures, which by the way, is a crime. I also got CCTV footage inside my office that sees even if the blinds are closed and the cops will be interested in seeing that once I do call them. So if you still want me to press charges, my mother broke down in tears and fell to her butt like a baby crying when it broke one of its toys. I turned off the intercom for that pitiful mess.
Security escorted them out and had to pry my sister off of one of the love seats in the reception area when she sat and insisted that she wanted to speak to me again and make me come to my senses. I have not seen them in person since, but I've seen plenty on the CCTV footage. I ended up editing the footage with an audio recording one of my employees took. I posted it on a dummy account and tagged my sister and mother. The whole of dad's family came down on her for such horrible behavior shortly after an ex-spouse's death and even her loony bin of an extended family could not find much to defend her for. I wanted to send my sister a gift for her kid, but after the incident, she sent a barrage of IMs and had her friends flooded me with even more. There were death threats, common online insults, racist and sexist comments and even threats that they would expose my infidelity to my current girlfriend. Me and my girlfriend looked over the messages and laughed at them as I compiled them into my police report against my sister and mother for if they ever decide to try to get into my life again. As of now, I've got them both blocked and hopefully can focus on the family me and my father created in our company and me and my girlfriend might make in the future since I do plan to propose. And ripe stars, we also have an update to the story and it reads like this. Update, a few weeks passed without any contact from my mom or sister. I assumed they had gone quiet after their public humiliation. However, I soon received a notice that my mother and sister had been charged with criminal offenses related to the incident at my office. I was asked to come to the police station to submit a statement and provide the CCTV footage as evidence. When I arrived, I was briefed on the charges and basically my mom was being charged with forgery for the fake will, assault for slapping me and criminal damage for destroying property in my office. My sister did not physically assault me but was complicit in the forgery and threatening messages. So she was being charged as an accomplice too. I then gave my statement and handed over the footage which clearly showed my mom's violent outburst and destruction of property. The footage also showed my sister closing the blinds and not intervening as my mother screamed at me and assaulted me. This was damning evidence against both of them. A few weeks later I received a court summons for the trial. On the day I showed up to testify as a witness for the prosecution, my mother and sister also arrived glaring daggers at me from across the courtroom. Their lawyers feebly tried to claim it was all a misunderstanding, but the evidence against them was insurmountable. I recounted the events calmly and factually for the jury. When the CCTV footage was played, gasps could be heard around the courtroom. It was shocking to see this level of violence and rage from my own mother. Her lawyer knew at this point the case was unwinnable. After a brief deliberation, the jury found my mother guilty on all charges. For the forgery charge involving the fake will, she was sentenced to one year in prison. For slapping me, she received two years in prison. And for the criminal damage, she was sentenced to one more year added to her sentence. In total, my mom was sentenced to four years imprisonment. And yeah, ripe stars, let me know what you think about this. Do you think the judge was too harsh on OP's mom or is this just right. I really hope for OP that his mom never comes back to him to harass him. I do hope though that everything goes well for the sister even though she seemed almost equally as entitled as the mom. Let's hope her kid does not get as entitled as the rest of the family. And the next one is a malicious compliance story. So this happened a long time ago somewhere around 2012 to 2013. I had a good friend who I smoked cigars with and he had a friend named Jim. I did not see Jim very often because we lived in different cities, but every time I visited we would smoke cigars in the park. Well, near the park, Jim was probably about the smartest guy that I've ever met and if I met Einstein he might be eeny mini mini mo. Well, almost. We called him subsection 6 because he was always finding loopholes for absolutely everything. He's the kind of guy that would read all the tax laws and interpretation bulletins and mold his life to that. He was one of the first people that was working from home. He had his printer in a different room than where he had his office so that he could claim more square footage as the home office. He was that kind of guy. And he was not an accountant or anything, he was just an IT guy and he read a lot. One day, the three of us went down to the beach to smoke cigars. In parks, you're not allowed to smoke, but we grabbed our chairs and went anyways. The tide was low, so we went down just past the rocks where the sand started and smoked away. That is where I heard this story. So remember Einstein told a story about if he had one hour to solve a problem to save his life, he would think of the proper question for 58 minutes. 
And well, Jim is one of those guys that ask questions that we don't think about. He looked around the park because he was busted one time and he asked himself this question. I can see the property line where the road is, I can see the property line where there's a house next door and he can see the property line where there was a hotel next. But where is the property line when you're looking out at the ocean? He did his homework and he found out that while the city owned the foreshore, it was DFO that owns the ocean from the high tide line down. That is crown land and they don't have a prohibition for smoking on the ocean. That is where we had our chairs the day he told me the story. So he lives in a retirement city with lots of old ladies who have their morning walks the same time he has his morning cigar. That is how he got busted in the first place, but he was ready after he did his research. He used that printer that was in the other room and he printed out the laws. He also made a phone call to one of his cigar buddies who was a lawyer who knew a lawyer that did property stuff. I'm not talking about real estate transactions when you buy a house, I'm talking about property rights, air rights, things like that. A lot higher up in the food chain. Top floor corner office kinda guy. So depending on cigar you're looking at 45 minutes to smoke a Robusto to an hour and a half for a Churchill or anything bigger than that. Soon thereafter the Karens came by complaining about him smoking in the park even though he was in the ocean. This was even years before anyone was called Karen. So the Karens started bugging him and threatened to call the police or by law and he told them to go ahead. He just started his cigar so he had plenty of time. He sent a message message to his lawyer friend of a friend to give him a heads up that he might be calling later. No problem. Well, the Karens didn't just call by law, they called the police. So Jim continued smoking a cigar while he handed over the printout regarding foreshore ownership. It's not the fault of the police because they are used to speeding and stuff like that, but they didn't know this law. By law comes by and pretty much the same so he gets on his phone, shows them the lawyer's website and makes the call. Meanwhile, the cops and bylaw are phoning their supervisors about this as well. Of course, the Karens are not happy, so they start complaining about the secondhand smoke, but they don't have any legal basis. Jim talks to the property rights lawyer on speakerphone and he says for the police and bylaw supervisors to give him a shout and he will enlighten them about where the park property begins and ends. And of course, the best part of the story is that we were smoking a 10 year old Punch Churchill when he told me the story. So the epilogue is that whenever he's smoking at low tide and by law comes by, not just for him but for dogs and drinking and other stuff like that, they always shake their head and wave. They told him that they've had complaints about him smoking in the park and they now ask where is the guy. In the park or down on the sand? Because the sand is not park, it's the ocean, so I just wanted to do a quick edit for a bunch of reasons. As far as the printer in Texas go, I don't know the whole story. What I do know is that he was subsection 6 and not only did he discover the law that said below high tide was not the park, but he also read a lot of the interpretation bulletins from the tax authority. He would not commit any tax fraud, he would use the rules to the full extent. Unfortunately, I cannot confirm what happened, I do know at this point that he has not been audited. I'm a semi newbie and I got some anonymous awards and it keeps telling me that chat is not available so I cannot thank those people. I will keep trying. Sometimes in your life you meet someone and you just go wow. Jim was that guy. There's a lot of things he did not have in his life, in other words wife and kids, but he lived his life like a how-to textbook. Everything was well thought out and structured. He was gregarious and kind and giving, that's all I'm gonna say. Second edit, so it appears that there are two flashpoints in the story and I would like to address both of those. So as far as taxes go, and I mentioned it before, not only did Jim read the interpretive bulletins, but knowing his thoroughness he would have confirmed this. I don't know the whole story, but I do know that we called him subsection 6 for a reason. I know, I just mentioned it above on my first edit, but there are still Americans saying that this is tax fraud and I'm sorry, but I'm not American even though I live in North America. People around the world have different tax laws than you. As far as secondhand smoke, anyone who lives on an ocean can tell you low tide can be a large area. We did not get a GPS to figure out where the high tide line was and smoke right on the edge, thumbing our noses to the people walking by on the path. We were far away from people because whether you are legally correct or not, there's always gonna be people yapping and why wreck a nice peaceful cigar by having people bother you. So now if I'm on an inland lake and I'm standing in water just below full bowl, that's a lot closer to the park. 
I've never actually done this on a lake because you have physical proximity. I don't like the smell of cigarettes, but if someone walks by my house smoking a cigarette and I'm in the front yard, I have no legal recourse. That's just the way it is. Would that person walking by on the road smoking a cigarette be a dick? Not specifically, I would just move away even though it is my property. And by the way, one more little fact before I close edit number two, Jim lived in an apartment condo and smoking on his balcony, although legal, did cause complaints. In the winter time, he smoked in his truck, yes, Febreze works, I've tried it myself, and in the summer he went to the park. In each situation he was further away from people than if it was smoking on his balcony in the summertime. And with this, we have reached the end of the video. However, if you cannot get enough of my content, please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.